So um, I have no conflict of interest to disclose. So when you face a case uh, like this, a patient, a young uh, patient, 13 or 15, uh, coming in with low back pain and um, many of them have uh, posture abnormalities and they have pain radiating to their lower limbs. What sort of decision-making process do you go through that when you, when you decide for their surgery? So um, I'm gonna go over the classifications of uh, high-grade L5-S1 uh, spondylolisthesis, understand, understand some of the biomechanics of the individual patient's spine, what's the relationship to pelvic parameters, um, and the golden question whether to reduce or not to reduce. So this is the classic way um, looking at um, uh, classifying which degree of uh, spondylolisthesis there is. Um, we're talking here at least 50% or more uh, of uh, Merdin classification. Uh, the problem with this classification is though it is easy to use um, and communicate with other colleagues, um, it's purely descriptive and not linked to treatment algorithms. Um, this uh, Wilsey classification uh, looked at the kind of pa pathology, what caused the um, spondylolisthesis. And this classification, again, although it's helpful in understanding the uh, pathology, however, uh, it was also not linked to algorithm, not patient-specific, and not linked to biomechanics. So it's been observed since the 80s that the high-grade spondylolisthesis is associated with abnormal sacropelvic morphology and local lumbosacral deformity and dysplasia. And that had implications on understanding the biomechanics and the treatment. So a little review, the pelvic incidence um, is measuring the uh, point from the middle of the uh, end plate of the uh, sacrum uh, when a perpendicular line on the sacrum to the middle of the femur head. Um, and the pelvic tilt and the sacral slope then follow the, the pelvic incidence is not a uh, variable with the patient's position. It's an inherent character of the pelvis of the patient. While the pelvic tilt and the sacral slope, they become variable depending on the patient's position. And the, geometrically, the pelvic incidence equals the sacral slope uh, plus the pelvic tilt. So um, literature came up showing that patients with spondylolisthesis uh, have higher grade of pelvic incidence. Uh, so look at this study by the Linky group, uh, looked at a control group of both pediatrics and adults, and compared that to the adult, uh, to the, the uh, spondylolisthesis, both of the low grade type and the high grade type, and they showed that the pelvic incidence um, was higher. Um, so for the low grade, uh, several studies have shown that pelvic incidence um, is higher. Uh, it's, uh, at the point, is a matter of association. The, um, um, it is uh, assumed that maybe it has a role to play in the development of uh, spondylolisthesis. And they classified the low grade into the shear type, which is the type on the left where the pelvic incidence is high, um, and the nutcracker type, which is, uh, describes spondylar diseases in a setting where the pelvic incidence um, is, is not high. And then the, uh, the spinal degenerative uh, uh, um, uh, classification came up, um, and it divided the spondylar diseases um, into uh, low grade and high grade, the low grade is further divided into the uh, low pelvic incidence, a normal pelvic incidence, and a high uh, pelvic incidence. And these are the, the description um, um, of the three groups. Um, and it is um, postulated that this type with a high pelvic incidence are more subject to uh, progressing and more subject to developing more back pain. 
Now for the high grade is a further extension of that. So this study looked at two, uh, 214 patients with developmental uh, L5-S1 spondylar diseases compared to 160 normal subjects. And they um, showed that the pelvic incidence, pelvic tilt, sacral slope, lumbar lordosis were significantly greater in spondylar diseases patients. And they increased with the increasing um, grade of uh, spondylar diseases. So um, there, uh, this study now came to differentiate those with a high-grade spondylar diseases and pelvic incidence and introduced the concept of a balanced pelvis or an unbalanced pelvis. And those with an unbalanced pelvis are those with a high uh, pelvic tilt, uh, so-called the retroverted uh, pelvis. So they introduced in the high-grade uh, balanced pelvis and retroverted uh, retro uh, pelvis. And we're talking here about, uh, this is a balanced pelvis with a normal pelvic tilt, but when the pelvic tilt is uh, uh, above normal, um, you're talking about a retro pelvic, uh, retroverted pelvis. Um, now, there is a subgroup of that um, which Dr. Anwar alluded to in the adult group, um, those with unbalanced spine. So when their plumb line is anterior to the uh, femoral heads. So this is where we are with the classification now, um, into low grade and high grade, the high grade into balanced pelvis and uh, um, with a low pelvic tilt, retroverted pelvis with an increased pelvic tilt. And those are further classified into a balanced spine and an unbalanced spine. And this is the classification, and this is shown in number, and you can go from left to right seeing that the pelvic incidence is increasing, and um, here the pelvic tilt is increasing as well, and in type six you have an unbalanced spine. So is this, is this classification uh, reliable? Um, so this is the, the uh, this study looked at this spinal deformity study group classification and uh, showed that there is substantial intra and inter-observer reliability uh, of this classification. And the degree of spondylolisthesis slip with this classification corresponds to the worst quality of life for those patients. So does this guide our treatment or could it influence your decision making and what about the clinical outcome? So the clinical implications are the risk of progression of low grade is higher when you have a higher pelvic incidence. Recall this is the group with the higher pelvic incidence. Um, the, some, the patients sometimes have a compensatory uh, posture change and a compensatory hyper lumbar lordosis uh, which reaches a limit above which they cannot tolerate and they get more back pain. So the reduction techniques may be implicated in the literature in types um, five and type six uh, of this classification. And uh, this paper sort of uh, gave an expert opinion on um, which ones would, it, would you uh, fuse in situ, um, which the majority of cases, but they also introduced the level of dysplasia of the lumbosacral junction. Um, and they reserved partial reduction into those with high grade and highly dysplastic. And this is, uh, for reference, the, how they classify the dysplastic features into uh, high grade. The surgical options are variable, just a posterior fusion without instrumentation, addition of instrumentation with variable degrees of reduction, front and back spondylopto, uh, spondylectomy, and the fibular strut graft. And the decision is really, so far, controversial. Um, this paper, uh, published in 1999, looked at 32 patients with ethmic dysplastic high grade spondylar diseases and looked at three surgical techniques inside the fusion, no decompression, no screws, uh, posterior decompression and instrumented fusion, and reduction with circumferential fusion. And you can see the uh, percentages of um, uh, pseudoarthrosis associated. However, there was no clinical difference. Better number, though, in the fusion group. Uh, pseudoarthrosis patients had a small TP area that was observed in the study. Um, one patient had HL weakness. This study looked at 44 patients, and they uh, had a rate of 9% uh, uh, of neurological complication permanent and 2% after in, uh, instrumentation and reduction. Um, 
uh, this uh, paper looked at correction of spinopelvic alignment um, uh, measures with um, the reduction techniques. However, it did not link to clinical outcome. And this is kind of missing in many of the papers uh, I've gone through. And mo majority of the papers are level um, uh, three evidence. Um, spondylectomy was described, Dr. Borgeli was on the paper of uh, this one, uh, um, and it was published even before this, but this one was published as a one-stage posterior uh, shortening in, in seven patients, and they had uh, good correction and reasonable outcome. Um, the complications, neurologic complications, were reported in uh, close to 30%. Uh, the most common was new neurologic deficit at, uh, at around the rate of 11%. Um, the rate of uh, L5 weakness also was reported at 30% in another paper. Hypothetical causes is some type of uh, neurologic deficit, sometimes related to direct pressure on the nerve roots, impingement on the nerve roots, uh, the iliolumbar ligaments, extradural tension on the nerve root, disc material extruded into the canal. And this anatomic study looked at when does the tension happen the max, and it usually happened 70% at the final 50% of the deformity correction. So I will show you three cases where I, um, at examples. Uh, this is a 13-year-old who presented to me seven years ago, and you can see this kind of postural deformity with retroverted pelvis and uh, bent uh, knees, uh, you can see the high grade L5 S1 this, uh, um, listhesis with dysplastic elongated and fractured pars. Um, I did some measurements that he has, uh, he had um, a high uh, pelvic incidence. Uh, and a high pelvic tilt. Uh, and what I ended up doing was partial reduction with an introduction of uh, a fibular strut from S1 to L5. Uh, and my aim was partial reduction, not a complete reduction, and, and give him an anterior column support as well. So this is how the fibula looked like. And I was amazed very soon after the surgery, his posture was aligned. His back pain has significantly improved. And we are now up to seven years follow up and he's even taller than I am now and he's doing very well. Uh, so partial reduction worked for him and uh, uh, the, you can see the pelvic tilt uh, has reduced after the surgery. The second case is a 20 year old lady with a high grade spondylolisthesis. She had a balanced spine. Um, and I also utilized the same technique in her. The, her pelvic incidence was high, like I described earlier. And this is the fibular strut, how it looks in the OR uh, from the back of S1 to uh, L5. And uh, I have followed her for three years uh, and she's done very well. Um, and her back pain improved. She went in to get married and had kids. Um, I didn't have a, a good sagittal x-ray to compare the, the numbers on this one, but clinically she did well. The fibular strut graft has been described before, the so-called the Bowman procedure, um, and this study looked at it in um, 17 patients, um, um, and it can be done anteriorly or posteriorly. This group did it mostly anteriorly and showed uh, no neurologic deficit and a very good uh, uh, fusion. Uh, this systematic review looked at the efficacy of transsacral instrumentation. Um, uh, they involved 311 studies, uh, reported 38 patients, and they reported good outcome um, of a transsacral fixation. This is uh, this case. Uh, I did not use the fibular strut graft. Uh, I thought in flexion extension and on MRI when she was lying uh, uh, supine that she had a reasonable reduction. So we attempted a partial reduction in her, and um, you can see she had a large pelvic incidence and increased pelvic tilt. Um, and. Um, this is what we have done. We achieved partial reduction uh, only going from L4 to S1 with no uh, strut, but we put a cage anteriorly, um, and she has done very well with uh, also improved in her sagittal uh, parameters. 
So take home message, I think this classification does make sense. It at least makes you understand the posture of the patient, the kind of pathology the patient is going through. If you will reduce um, uh, reduction is uh, kind of indicated for better alignment. You don't have to achieve a full reduction, uh, especially in the last 50% of the reduction, you have to be careful. Um, and if you reduce, you may want to consider uh, um, bilateral nerve root decompression and consider gradual mobilization after surgery and have her, their hips and knees flex and with gradual uh, extension of that. And the studies were mostly retrospective. I see a role of uh, databases here and multi-center uh, trials. And at the end, I would like to invite you to Jeddah in April for the Saudi neurosurgery uh, meeting. Thank you.